I love testing. Unit testing is fantastic. Integration testing is fantastic. All of these things are, are wonderful. The idea of making sure that your code does what it's supposed to do is a really wonderful thing. Um, one of the things that is interesting about testing, though, especially unit testing, is that you start to run into this scenario where you say, I've got an input and it needs to match an output. And uh, it really simplifies things, but it also means that you have a lot of boilerplate code that's calling your function with an input and expecting that output to be the same. It gets extra tricky if you run into scenarios where you have to like mock things and stub things and all sorts of other fun dilemmas. Um, and that's so common, in fact, that we have a solution for it in Go called table-driven testing, uh, which is really nice, but that's actually not what this video is about. Um, this video is about fuzzing. So fuzzing is the idea that uh, you can not know your inputs and not know your outputs, but if you have a way to deterministically uh, check that your inputs and outputs do what they're expected to do um, from each other, then you're able to write tests without knowing your inputs or outputs, where Go will generate inputs and outputs against a set of constraints to help you determine if your function is doing what you would expect it to do. It's kind of a mouthful. Um, I actually was looking for a really great example to talk through this, and the tutorial on the Go website is really fantastic. So I actually thought it'd be fun to just walk through the tutorial together. So that's what we're going to do. Okay, so you can see my screen. Uh, so project tutorials. I'm going to make dir, um, and I think we're going to call this fuzzing. I'm going to try to stick pretty true to the tutorial here. So it's called fuzz, and I'll be sure to link the tutorial. It's text-based um, in the comments or the, the video description as well. Uh, but the idea here is, so we have this fuzz directory that we're creating. We're going to go mod init example slash fuzz. I'm going to cat our go mod file. Looks good. I'm using go 122.4. Fuzzing has been around for a little while now, so um, any fairly recent version of go should be good. Um, and with this in mind, uh, we're going to go ahead and create our main.go. And we're going to write a function here. This function is going to do something that um, is fairly straightforward. Uh, so if we say package main, I'm going to create a function called reverse. And it's going to take in a string, and it's going to reverse a string. Fairly straightforward. The way this works is a little interesting. So this is going to convert our string into bytes, and then we're going to go for byte by byte from the front and the back um, and swap these. So in our case, we have for ij is equal to 0, and then the length of b minus 1. i is less than length of b divided by 2. i j equal to i plus 1, i plus 1, j minus 1. Okay, that is a wild for function. Um, and this is actually a really great example of something that would be good to test on its own because this is already a little complicated for a for loop at least. Uh, so we can swap our bytes here. So we have uh, b sub i, b sub j. Oops, sorry about that. I'm not sure how that happened. Uh, b sub j. In fact, let me just move the mouse out of the way. I think I bumped it. Uh, b sub j, b sub i. So we're just swapping our bytes in this case. Uh, now we want to return a string of b. Okay, cool. Uh, I've got an extra j right there. Not sure how that happened. So with this in mind, we can go ahead and create like a main function. And maybe this will be like uh, kind of our first pass at testing this, right? So we have input the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. OK. Um, if we want to reverse this, we would call our reverse function. And we call input. I don't really know what the reverse of this is. I'm guessing it's D, uh, G O D space Y Z A whatever. Uh, we can quickly identify this with a print line. So let's do that, right? So let's go ahead and print line the reverse. Let's go ahead and run this. Undefined bytes and fumped. Oh, interesting. I don't know why Go please didn't import 
FMT and Okay, it just needs FMT. Sorry. It... There we go. Okay, cool. Yeah, that looks right. Uh, G-O-D space Y-Z-A-L space E-H-T and, and so on. Uh, so we have a, this is essentially like our first unit test, right? So let's go ahead and convert this to a unit test. So we can say main test dot go. Um, and then when writing tests, we need to give it a package. So this one's going to be package main since it's the same as our main package. That's what we're testing. We need to import testing. And then we create a test function. So our function starts with the word test. Uh, we have test reverse. It takes in a T, which is a pointer to testing T. Um, and then I mentioned earlier table-driven tests. So let's write a table-driven test. So we have a slice of structs. These structs have an in and a want, and these are strings. So we have an input and the value that we want from our uh, test case, uh, from, from calling reverse in our case. Um, and so we have hello world. We have D-L-R-O-W, O-L-L-E-H. And we could do that quick brown fox one that we did here. I think that the hello world covers it. Um, so we'll, we'll just stick with that. We have another case, like what if we reverse an empty string? Well, that should be an empty string. And then maybe another case, which is what if we reverse some numbers and uh, a special character? Okay, so with this in mind, we need to execute our tests. So if you've not seen table-driven tests, this is generally how they look. You have your table up there of test cases, uh, and then you iterate over you iterate over your test cases and then you call your function. So in our case, it's the reverse function and we pass in the input. And then if reverse is not equal to test case dot want, then we call t dot error f. And we say something like reverse percent q, uh, want percent q, and then we can pass in reverse and test case dot want. Uh, oops. Small issue on my end. That F needs to be a small F, not a big F. And I think we should be good. So now we can save this file and I can run go test and our test pass. Uh, so now we can look at fuzzing. So like I mentioned before, we don't really care that hello comma world is D-L-R-O-W space comma O-L-L-E-H. We care that the string is reversed. And thankfully with reversing a string, if you reverse it and then reverse the reversed, you have a way to check that the values are what you would expect, right? If I reverse a string twice, it should be the original string. So with that in mind, we could actually change our tests to model that. And we don't really need to because we're going to write a fuzzing test instead. So the idea with fuzzing is very, very similar. So we have a function and it starts with the fuzz keyword. So we have fuzz reverse. And instead of a testing F, we get a pointer to a testing. Or I'm sorry, instead of a testing T, we get a pointer to a testing F. We can define our test cases just like before. This one's a little different, though. Um, mainly because we don't need to worry about our outputs. We have hello world. We'll use the same inputs as before. And one, two, three, four, five. Excellent. Uh, but yeah, we don't care about our outputs. So this is essentially going to be our seed corpus. Um, but we need to add these test cases to our seed corpus. So we'll iterate over the test cases just like we did in the normal unit test. But this time, instead of actually executing the test, we will add these to our fuzzing. Uh, again, this is what adds them to a seed corpus. Now we can call f.fuzz. Uh, this takes in a function. I'm going to make sure I get this right. It's a uh, testing t that we get, and then we get the original string. OK, so in here we can call reverse on the original string. And then, in theory, reversing a reverse string should give us the original, right? 
So we can check if original is not equal to double reverse t dot error f before after and then we can pass in the original and then we can pass in double reverse. Okay. Uh, let's add another check here. We can check if these are UTF-8 valid strings. Um, and what we really want to do is check if the original is a UTF-8 valid string, then the uh, reverse string should be a valid UTF-8 string, right? So if it's not the case, then we want to fail. So let's do that in reverse. And then we can say t dot error f reverse produced invalid utf8 string oops reverse okay i think we have a pretty good fuzz going on here so if we actually want to run our fuzzing what we need to do is go test and we pass in fuzz equals fuzz okay cool we immediately ran into an error uh, and you can see this is an interesting error because reverser produced invalid UTF-8 string. So we ran into a string that's not valid UTF-8. This is something we wouldn't probably catch if we just wrote a unit test. Maybe someone would think, hey, what if we are working with non-valid UTF-8 strings? Or what if we have something that reverses into a non-valid UTF-8 string? Um, that might be something that you catch if you really, really think about it uh, when writing that unit test. But most of the time, people aren't really thinking about strings that aren't valid UTF-8 encoding, unless they're working on something that is encoding related. So we have a couple options. We can try to tighten our fuzzing constraints so we don't run into this edge case. Um, but this is a valid edge case, right? You could totally pass in a string to our reverse function that isn't valid UTF-8. Let's fix it, right? So let's open our main.go. And we can make some progress here by changing our uh, byte slice to a slice of runes, right? And the reason that we run into this issue is because if we are swapping byte by byte instead of rune by rune, there's a chance that we get uh, we mangle our bytes in such a way that when we try to convert it to a string here down on line 13, it's not a valid UTF-8 string anymore. But if we start processing them rune by rune, we should be good. Um, so one thing I didn't mention that is important, once you have a failing fuzz like this, you can just run go test. So if we run go test, we can see that, hey, our fuzzing passed. Um, in fact, uh, if we run into another error, I'll show you that one more time so you can see it as is. I probably should have done that before. So now that we have our, our test that we have ran and we fixed it, let's fuzz some more. So if we fuzz, hey, look, we have ran into another issue. OK, so a key thing here, I, I really should have mentioned this earlier, is the uh, failing input written to the test data. And then it tells you how to rerun that specific test case. So if you want to run this specific test case again and again and again, you can use that command. Um, or you can run go test because now that we found this error, every time we run go test, it will show up until we fix it. So even though we don't have a unit test for this, it's added to the corpus. We know that we're fuzzing. We know that we have found an error. Go test wants to make sure we don't forget about it, which is fantastic. Okay, so we ran into another error. This one's interesting, right? Uh, because you can see that when we reverse the value and reverse it back, it's not the same. So this is an interesting one. How do we run into this? So in our case, if the input isn't valid UTF-8, we run into this error, right? So what we can do is if we come in here, um, and, and again, like if you wanted to check this, you could add print lines here to check the uh, incoming string and then check the value after you convert it to runes. Um, but in our case, we know that the error is an issue where the original string is not valid utf8 so we can say if utf8 dot valid string s sorry if it's not valid then we want to return the string and maybe like errors dot new 
and then say something like input is not valid UTF-8. Okay. Uh, we're going to run into some issues here. We need to add a nil error at the end of our function. And then where we call our function, we need to take in that error. Um, you should always check your errors. For the sake of this being a tutorial, I'm just going to ignore them. Uh, then main test.go, and then we'll need to do the same thing here. So basically everywhere that we call our reverse function, so we can come down here, swap that in, come here, swap that in, Add another error right there. I think we should be good with those. So we receive our error value, we're just ignoring it. Now if we were to run that test that failed again and again and again, our test has passed. Excellent. So hopefully you've seen like, these are really weird edge cases that are totally valid. These are strings that could be provided to our reverse function, but there's no way we're gonna think about these when we're writing unit tests. Um, so Fuzzin can help us find those values that are totally valid from a uh, type safety perspective, um, but are things that we might not think about. And Fuzzing is actually really good at catching certain issues like uh, cross-site scripting issues. Um, what would be the other ones? Denial of service issues, buffer overflow issues, SQL injection. Those are the things that like often aren't thought about in unit tests, but Fuzzing can really help us catch. So now that we fixed this issue, I think there's one last thing to do, and it's to continue fuzzing. So if we run go test and we fuzz again, this will run. I'm gonna let this run for uh, close to a minute maybe, and we can look at the output. Uh, if you don't wanna let this run indefinitely, um, you can also provide a uh, fuzz time, I believe is the flag, um, and you provide it like a value in seconds, and it will fuzz for that duration, so it doesn't, continue to fuzz and fuzz and fuzz. It'll only fuzz for about 10 seconds, and then it will carry on. I'm gonna let this run for uh, 10 more seconds, and then we can look at the output. I was hoping that new interesting might change from just one to two or three, but it is what it is. Um, also worth mentioning that this ends as soon as it finds an error. So we've been fuzzing for 45 seconds, 48 seconds, and we've not ran into an error. So our code, feel, I feel pretty good about our code right now. Um, we'll let this get to a minute. Okay, cool. I ended it at just a minute. Um, so we have executed, what, 15,274,807 uh, fuzz tests in, in this uh, case. Uh, you can see how many we're executing per second, which is what, 255,390 per second. It has found two new interesting cases that are being added to our corpus, and then uh, a total of 45. Um, so again, we are just constantly creating values that match the type safety, uh, or our type signatures for our tests, um, using our seed corpus as a seed to kind of get started from, and then executing our function against those to prove that they are doing what we would expect them to do. And if something fails, it fails and lets us know. And ideally we go fix that test. Um, and if it doesn't fail, it continues to fuzz until we tell it not to. Hopefully this was really valuable. Um, again, any function where you don't necessarily need to know your inputs and your outputs, and you can deterministically decide if your function is doing what you would expect it to. Like this reverse function is such a good example because reversing a string twice gives you the original. Um, so like, this is a really great example, but, uh, yeah, if you are ever in that scenario where you don't necessarily need to know your inputs and your outputs ahead of time, look at fuzzing. It's really helpful. I mean, you saw it highlighted two bugs that I would never have thought about, um, when writing unit tests. So hopefully this has been helpful. If it was helpful, uh, please give me a thumbs up. It really helps with the algorithm on YouTube, and if you want to learn more about Go and other fun programming topics like virtual machines and, um, well, just a ton of different things, really, uh, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Thanks, and have a fantastic day.